Good morning. Welcome to Acromag's webinar on frequency and pulse devices and applications. My name is Rob Freewald and thank you for joining us. Okay, we will be discussing these types of sensors and instruments. Magnetic pickups, photoelectric proximity and capacitive sensors, turbine flow meters, and tachometers. The primary purpose of this webinar is to become familiar with these devices, their operation, common applications, and the features needed in the signal conditioner for accurate and proper measurements. A magnetic pickup, or a speed sensor, is basically a coil wound around a permanent magnet, which creates a magnetic field around the mag pickup. When the iron objects, such as a gear teeth or on a flywheel, turbine rotor blades, slotted discs, shafts with keyways or bolt heads, pass by the sensing area. A changing air gap varies the magnetic field strength. An AC voltage output is then developed. Factors affecting the output are the permanent magnet, the coil winding, the dimensions and spacings of the teeth or notch, the pole construction, and the air gap. At the right is a depiction of the magnetic field that surrounds the mag pickup. This follows the right-hand rule with the coil wrapped around the magnet from top to bottom. With your right hand and palm away from you, your fingers follow the direction of the coil windings and your thumb is down, pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. Here are some mag pickup applications for engine speed, motor speed, material handling, industrial equipment, vehicle controls, and flow measurement. At the upper right is an engine flywheel with a mag pickup mounted at the edge. Below that is a turbine flow meter with the mag pickup at the top. At the bottom is a conveyor system with a mag pickup to sense the conveyor's belt speed. The mag pickup output is an AC voltage which can be from millivolts to over 200 volts peak to peak. This is a bipolar voltage that crosses to the zero volt level. The output frequency is directly proportional to the rotational speed. The output waveform depends upon the surface area shape. As the air gap changes, the output changes. If the air gap does not change, the output waveform settles. The cam on the left shows this well, with no output between the edges of the tooth. There are two important considerations. The mag pickup output waveform tends to rise as the speed increases, so it's important to ground the return lead. Also, the peak-to-peak -peak voltage changes with speed. Make sure the amplitude is not too low to capture or too high for circuitry ratings. These sensors are selected based upon the material of the object and the distance, which are commonly used ranges. Photoelectric sensors are used for longer distances, provided the object is non-transparent, such as clear glass. Photo eyes are also well suited for dusty or wet environments. Through beam pairs can be used with opacity meters in the exhaust gas of electrostatic precipitators to sense the amount of ash or smoke particles. In car washes, through beam pairs can see through the spraying liquid and detect the car easily. Inductive is used to detect metal objects and capacitive for non-metal objects. Capacitive sensors can be used to detect metals, but inductive sensors are more rugged and lower cost, so they are normally used with metal. There are sensors that can operate at distances beyond these typical ranges, such as through beam pairs that can work out to 30 feet. But the ranges here are good general guidelines. Photoelectric sensors use a light source, typically infrared, and a receiver to detect the presence of objects. Here are the three commonly used types of photo eyes. Diffuse has the light source and receiver housed together and use the light reflected directly off the object for detection. The distance is affected by object color, say light versus dark, and the type of surface, whether it's shiny or not. Retroreflective has the light source and receiver housed together and requires a reflector. An object is detected when it interrupts the light beam between the sensor and reflector. Longer distances than diffuse types can be sensed. 
through beam has the light source and receive a house separately. An object is detected when it interrupts the light beam between the light source and receiver units. These photo eyes allow for the longest distances. For sensing the presence of metal objects, an inductive proximity sensor is most often used. This sensor consists of a coil, oscillator, detector, and output circuit. Instead of a permanent magnet, power is applied to these two, three, or four wire sensors. A coil generates a high frequency magnetic field in front of the face. The presence of a metallic object in the sensing area absorbs some of the energy, which causes a dampening of the oscillation amplitude. The rise or fall of the amplitude is detected by a threshold circuit that switches the sensor output. Capacitive sensing is a technology suitable for detecting nonmetals, solids, and liquids. The sensor consists of four basic components. Sensor electrodes, an oscillator, a detector, and an output circuit. Instead of a high-frequency magnetic field, capacitive sensors generate an electrostatic field. This field reacts to changes in capacitance caused when an object enters the electrostatic field. When the object is outside this field, the oscillator is inactive. As the object moves closer to the prox face, a capacitive coupling develops and the oscillator is activated. When the oscillation frequency reaches a preset threshold, it triggers the output circuit to switch between on and off. An external adjustment sets the operating distance to switch the output. Here are some applications for these types of sensors. Material handling, conveyors, automation, manufacturing systems, materials processing, and various process industries. At the upper right is a capacitive sensor and a packaging operation which can see through a box to detect whether an object is present or not. The lower left picture shows through beam photo eyes on a conveyor counting objects. To the right of that is an inductive sensor that is sensing the presence of metal pulse in this assembly. At the far lower right is a capacitive sensor that is looking through the tube and sensing liquid level. These sensors generate unipolar square wave outputs with an amplitude based on the supply voltage. The square wave outputs are at zero volts or at the maximum voltage. On the left is an open collector NPN transistor. When the transistor is on, the collector is low or near ground. When the transistor is off, the collector must be pulled high or it would float. The NPN is switching ground to the output. Thus, it is referred to as a low side switch. In the center is an open collector PNP transistor. When the transistor is on, the collector is high. When the transistor is off, the collector must be pulled low or it would float. The PNP is switching the supply voltage to the output. Thus, it is referred to as a high side switch. On the right is a simplified TTL output circuit or inverter circuit. When transistor A is on, transistor C is on, pulling the output low or near ground. When transistor A is off, transistor C is off. So if the output would not float, transistor B is used to pull the output high. Since the output is driven low or high, no load resistor is needed. A turbine flow meter measures both liquid and gas. It uses the mechanical energy of the fluid to rotate a rotor in the flow stream. This converts flow stream energy into rotational energy. A fluid enters the meter through the inlet and passes by a flow straightener that reduces its turbulent flow to improve the velocity characteristics. It then moves through the turbine blades, causing it to rotate at a speed that is proportional to its velocity. A mag pickup is mounted outside above the rotor. The ear gap is inside between the channel metal wall and the rotor blades. The sensor generates a pulse each time a blade passes by. Outputs represent either a frequency proportional to the volumetric flow rate or pulses that are counted for the total fluid that has passed through the turbine flow meter. High accuracy turbine flow meters are also available for custody transfer of oil and natural gas. A tachometer is an instrument that measures the rotational speed of an object. They typically have a dial or a digital readout to indicate speed in RPMs and work by counting pulses generated from an alternator, ignition system, 
or a speed sensor. The sensor can be magnetic or optical. Magnetic types include mag pickups, inductive proxies, and Hall effect sensors. Optical types include photoelectric or laser that focus a beam of light against a reflective element or slotted disk. The lower right picture is a retroreflective photo eye with the reflector mounted on a rotating shaft. With an electronic tachometer, a digital output signal can also be transmitted. This output signal is typically TTL compatible as a 5 volt square wave output and connects to a counter or a signal conditioner. In the upper right is a dynamometer that's testing an engine. Acrobatic's new TT series is programmed via a USB connection, the easy plug and play program. The software runs on a PC. With these units, there are no external adjustments which can prevent inappropriate field calibration when troubleshooting a total system. If the system is not functioning properly, most of us typically tweak the easiest controls we can find, and adjusting a signal conditioner can be easier than tracing the wiring, rescaling an HMI, or examining a PLC's program. Here is a screen capture of the I.O. configuration page showing the entries available. At the bottom is a button to pull the unit and display the actual input value. So let's quickly go through some of these features. First, we must calculate the input range by converting RPMs to frequency. For this example, let's use a MAC pickup, a maximum engine speed of 2400 RPM and 120 tooth gear. Multiply 2400 revolutions per minute times 1 minute is 60 seconds times 120. The minutes cancel and you're left with 4800 pulses per second or hertz. The scaling is for the input 0 to 4800 hertz and the output is 4 to 20 for this example. Threshold is the level at which the input signal must pass through in order for the signal conditioner to measure it. For bipolar voltage inputs, the threshold is at 0 volts. For unipolar voltage inputs, the threshold can be 1.6 or 5.2 volts. So you must know the maximum amplitude of the square wave to select the threshold level. Select the load resistor, pull up, pull down, or disable for, dis for source inputs like TTL signals. The cutoff frequency is a feature that forces the output to the minimum level, in this case 4 mils, when the input is above the minimum or 0 hertz here. This is useful for large rotating machinery that may lose power or if electrical connections are lost, and they continue to rotate because of their large inertia. Forcing the output to 4 milliamps is an immediate alarm or notification of power loss, even if the machine continues to rotate. The balance is important so that input pulses are accurately measured. This is especially useful when the input is a contact that bounces after closing, giving false pulses. Input signal averaging is done by using two features which acts together, sampling and output update. Sampling is the number of samples that are averaged from between 1 and 20, 125 max. Output update is the amount of time for each sample from 10 milliseconds to 5 seconds. For this example, 100 samples and 10 milliseconds per sample, the input is averaged for 1 second. At the right is a graph showing this. The output is updated every 10 milliseconds based on a one second moving average of the input. The cutoff frequency also overrides the input signal averaging and forces the output to the minimum level immediately. For pulse width modulated inputs, select the duty cycle measurement. The changing duty cycle is shown at the right and is calculated by the on time divided by the total time period multiplied by 100. The input can be constantly changing frequency between 0 and 3 kilohertz, and this product will still be able to accurately measure the duty cycle. One application is to monitor pulsed lasers for feedback to control circuits. There are many types of lasers which can operate from kilohertz to gigahertz. By pulsing the laser beam, the power level can be changed for cutting or welding applications. Pulsing can be achieved using pulse width modulation. Here's some of the uh, high performance engineered into these products. The maximum amplitude can be 
plus or minus 170 volts DC or 120 volts RMS. So the 120 volt AC power can be connected directly to the input of this model to monitor the 60 hertz line frequency. The minimum pulse width of down to 2 microseconds and the frequency uh, duty cycle is 1% to 99%. And the scaling can be anywhere from 0 to 100 kilohertz. It can even be as narrow as 59.5 to 61.5 if you're monitoring line frequency. And you can have reverse acting outputs. Also, the temperature is extremely wide with vibration and approvals included. Here are the types of outputs for the TT230 and the TT330. The TT230 output can be wired for either syncing or sourcing. At the bottom left is a typical output loop powered connection with a load such as a DCS or PLC where the powered input provides power for the loop. The TT239 is wired as a syncing output and receives power from the load to operate. The load powers the loop and the TT239 controls the 4 to 20. The circuit above this is wired with a 24 volt external power supply. We provide extra terminals and a floating output. This allows the TT230s to still be output loop powered, yet source the 4 to 20 to the passive load. At the right is the TT330 that is powered by a DC supply instead of taking power from the I.O. loops. The outputs are either sourcing current or a voltage. Standard outputs plus bipolar outputs are available. This series also has a bus power feature. This allows multiple units to attach the bus connectors together so that one power connection is made to multiple units. Also, power can be wired to the terminals and or the bus connectors together, offering a redundant power connection. Here we show the connection between a module and a PC. A USB isolator is placed between the two and prevents any potential ground loops. On a desktop PC, if the AC plug is a three-way plug with a grounded center tap, that center tap is tied to the USB ports, shorting the power ground to the module circuit ground. On a laptop, the AC plug may not have a center tap, but all of its USB ports are tied together. So if there are other USB connections, then a ground loop can be created between the ports. The TT series software kit includes the USB isolator and all the cables necessary. Let's take a quick look at a couple of other ECMAG solutions. The ECMAG 841T1500 can accept frequency or pulsed inputs. It has both an analog output and an alarm output. To totalize pulses, you select the event counter for the input. As the unit counts pulses, the analog output increases. It can be programmed for any full-scale input between 1 and 65,535 pulses. At the full-scale count, the analog output can hold at, in this case, 10 volts, or return the output to zero and hold, or return the output to zero and resume counting. For the alarm relay output, any set point can be entered between 1 and 65,535 pulses. Finally, the 989EN-4016 remote I.O. model communicates over an Ethernet network using Modbus TCP IP protocol. It has 16 discrete channels where each can be an input or an output, but up to eight of the channels can be used as counters. These are 32-bit counters, so the maximum is about 4.3 billion counts. Each counter can be set to count up or down, so a preset level can be entered and that channel would count down to zero. At the endpoints, either zero or about 4.3 billion, another channel associated with that counter can be used as an alarm. The maximum input rate for counting pulses can be up to 150 hertz. The counts are stored in non-volatile memory and are retained with loss of power. If you look at the screen capture of the counter test page as viewed in your internet browser, the first channel has counted 735 pulses and the second channel has counted over 724 million pulses. Okay, just to summarize, with knowledge of your application, you choose the appropriate sensors, you understand how the sensor outputs work, select the signal conditioner for that, you program it and configure it, uh, check our operating manual for proper winding, wiring and grounding, 
and then verify your system. Okay, so that's it. I don't know if there's any questions. If you don't have any now, we can you can send us an email later at sales at acumag.com. If you need more information, uh, you can call us at that number, or uh, you can check us out on our website for the new TT series at acumag.com slash TT. Thank you very much.